Hi there, my name's Andy Young and I'm one of the automotive lecturers down at Unitech in Auckland, New Zealand and welcome to my Andy Mechanic YouTube channel. Now, a bit of fun for this one. Uh, we're back on with some more work on Ben's Yamaha TDR 250 1988 vintage and we're going to make a start putting the engine back together. Unfortunately, this job was started about a year ago before I started making these videos. So all the disassembly, and it was really interesting actually, and I'll try and find some photos and put them on the screen you know, while I'm doing this little talky bit. Um, essentially what happened is Ben bought the bike from Wellington a few years ago, four or five, maybe about four years ago, and he just rode it and rode it and rode it. And he put quite a lot of Ks on it, put about 30,000 kilometers. And uh, unfortunately, one day, he was leaving the house at Puhoi, going down our gravel drive, and the back wheel on the bike locked up, and it basically spat him off on the drive. He was very upset. He was jumping around all red-faced and very, very upset, because he doesn't usually fall off motorcycles. He's a pretty good rider. And it turned out that on the right-hand cylinder, the power valve had made contact with the piston, caused the piston to seize in the bore, and of course, crankshaft stops, gearbox stops, chain stops, wheel stops, bend falls off. And uh, we pulled the engine apart and lo and behold, we could see there was some damage on the right hand piston. And the piston actually was so damaged, it was really wedged in the cylinder. It took quite a bit of getting out. And uh, after all the inspections were done, we came up to the conclusion that uh, the big end bearings, and I'll show you those when I pull, uh, pull all the covers off, the protective covering that we put on the bike, Big end bearings were in pretty good nick, so we could we were able to leave the crank in situ and just do a top end rebuild. But the right hand cylinder was very badly scored, and we actually thought at the time it was too badly scored to be machined out. Although, fortunately, Ben went on the internet, and the TDR 250 engine is essentially the same as a TZR 250 motor. There's not much difference, although there's a few minor details. Um, but he managed to find some oversized pistons. Now, um, Yamaha only go up to 1.5 mil oversized pistons. He managed to find uh, the 2 mil. See that? Look? 2 mil oversized piston and all the various bits and pieces. So we got the bores. This was the one that caused all the problems. We got the bores, remachined, rebored out. To suit those new pistons. And uh, when they did the rebar work, the guy from uh, Engine Specialities in Glenfield gave me a call. Uh, Glenn, I think his name was, from memory. And he was a little bit dubious about how much clearance to put between the piston and the bore. So we had to do some pretty complicated calculations and quite a bit of research to work out what we felt was going to be the best. And for the life of me, I can't remember what we agreed on, but we are about right. And hopefully, when this bike goes for its test ride, after it's all been built up, it's not going to nip up on us. Fingers crossed. So we had both cylinders reboard, and these, these cylinders are like hen's teeth now. Really hard to find. Um, or oh, another phrase, rocking horse shit. Basically, you just can't get hold of them anymore. And if we hadn't have been able to machine that out, if the grooves were too badly, or too deep in the cylinder wall, then we'd have had some real problems with this machine. Uh, and getting it back on the road again. Um, one other thing that we did, well two things actually, to the head of the engine. Uh, we had it skimmed. Oh nice and look at that, nice and shiny. Mm. Okay, always good to get your head skimmed. A bit more compression ratio as well, goes faster. And at the same time we got some really cool time certs fitted for the spark plugs and you can see that sort of coppery colour there. Look, they're not um, helicoils. Helicoils are like a they're not really any good for stuff that you're taking in and, in and out all the time. It's like you a, a, a put the bolt in once, leave it alone. Um, they t sometimes can come out with the bolts. They're not that reliable. Time certs, which are much thicker, and they're not made of a coil of wire. They're made from a tube that's got a thread on the in inside, the internal thread, which is your original size thread, and it's got an external thread as well. They are much, much better. And I usually use those time certs made by Worth. But these... We had these professionally fitted um, by engine specialities. They did that, they skimmed the head, 
and they did the reboard for us as well. So um, Ben has spent the last year, and it's almost a year, to, actually just over a year, um, sourcing all the parts from around the world to rebuild this bike because they're getting so hard to find. Um, we're not just going to be changing um, the pistons and rings uh, for the rebore. Obviously, we've got to, uh, uh, and we're not also uh, not just changing the bushes for the power valves. We're actually going to be fitting brand new Yamaha power valves. And to give you an idea of the part number, I'm not sure they're the same both sides. Let's have a look. What have we got? KT, sorry, 1KT-1132A00. That's one of them. And that's the other one there, look, ends in a 10. So they are different. They are sided. And uh, these are also very, very hard to get hold of now. Uh, we've got all the new bushes. Uh, we've got one there, look. And there's another one there. So there's some more part numbers for you if you're looking around on the net for that kind of stuff. That's two of the bushes. And what else? We've got must be another bush somewhere. Because I think there's three of them. Or four, in fact, actually. So there's another, another bush there, look. Okay, got the part number. And yes, lastly, one more. There you go. So that's both power valves, all four bushes. Now, the problem we had, I'm not sure if you can see it on here or not. No, it's not on that one. Don't know where it is. Maybe I'll come across it during the rebuild. But the, the quadrant that the two um, YPVS cables that come from the, the stepper motor that controls the YPVS. Um, the quadrant itself was uh, where it connects to one of the power valves, which is this, this, this little piece here, look. The power valve was really, really worn, uh, and the mating surface for that, and this was worn too. And the problem was the power valve also wasn't accurately opening correctly you know it was there was a lot of slop on it slop in it that didn't cause it to hit the piston no 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 the reason why I hit the piston is because the bushes were allowing the power valve to move uh, or the clearance between the power valve and the piston to disappear crunch basically um, so that quadrant we couldn't get from Yamaha anymore so we had to go through a really cool place in England called yambits.com and there's your part number. That's their part number. Obviously not a Yamaha part number. So we had to get that. And uh, what else did we get? Well, we also got a lot of new um, seals for the power valves. So we've got that one there. I think that's the same part number. 93108 Yes, that's the same as that one. And same again there, look. So you needed three of those. So he managed to get all those bits together, and he's brought a lot of new nuts and bolts and bits and pieces as well, and head nuts. What else has he got? Oh, okay, a couple of little tiny washers. Not too sure where they're going to go, but he's got a stack of those. There's three of those. We'll find out where they go later on. And he's bought some seals and stuff, which I think are actually for his gearbox. Maybe Ben's forgotten to tell me about that. Extra, extra job to do. And then we've got something in a box. Ah, oh, okay, so we've even got a new spring as well here, look. Now, um, I'm not sure whether that spring is to do with the power valve system, but I don't think it is. I think that's to do with his oil pump. Yes, that's right. This is an oil pump, a two-stroke oil pump that runs off the crank. That's an overhaul kit, so I've got that to overhaul as well. That'll be another video, no doubt. Okay, right, and we've got two pistons, and um, these are two millimeter oversize, and again, that's the part number there, look, PTK093. There we go, and that's about all it says on there, actually. Um, you'll be very careful when buying pistons. This is a, a Makita, or Matika brand there, look, and the, they actually have pistons made in different places around the world, but I'm told... So long as you get the ones that are made in Japan, and you can see that just in there, look, made in Japan, then they're pretty good. You shouldn't have too many problems. The ones that are not made in Japan, hmm, not good. So I'm told. I don't have any direct experience with piston failure um, from the ones that are not made in Japan, but so I'm told there are problems. Okay, 
One last thing we're going to need is the original Yamaha service manual stuff. This is very, very important. You need this kind of stuff because it gives you all the data. Now, I'm very fortunate that I've managed to secure... Th this actually came with the bike. The guy in Wellington gave us this. Um, but I've actually managed to secure, via my friend Ian at Yamaha, the, the PDF version of this manual. So what I'm going to do for you is, as I do the rebuild, uh, and the, there's going to be loads of videos covering this. It's just going to be a, a series of videos, and I'm not really sure how far we're going to get on this particular video, but we're going to start by inspecting the big end bearings. I've got all the, all the gasket surfaces still to clean up because I'm really lazy like that. I should have done that a year ago already, shouldn't I? And uh, we're going to install the new pistons onto the conrods uh, with the new little unbearings and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, hope. Oh, and what we're also going to do is install the new power valves onto the, um, onto the barrels. So, fitting the pistons will be on this video. The next video is going to be installing the power valves into the heads. And then, once that's done, the third video will be installing the barrels. Sorry, heads, I say heads onto the barrels, putting the power valves into the barrels and then the third video no doubt is going to be installing the two barrels onto the engine, getting the pistons in there and uh, the fourth video is going to be calibrating the YPVS, setting all that stuff and then probably we can put the head on that'll be the fifth video, so there's going to be a great stack of videos I want to try and do this in reasonably small bite sized chunks I'm trying to avoid those, those sort of one hour videos so I need to shut up down already because I keep talking. But that's the history of the bike. That's where we're at. And I'm very sorry that I didn't video the disassembly because, hey, it would have been really cool. Very, very interesting. But I did take some photos. So I'll stick those on and, uh, well, we should be done by then. Right. Um, so to the bike. Let's go and unwrap the bike. Get all that uh, plastic sheeting off that we put on there a year ago. And uh, hopefully it's still going to be nice and clean in there. And we can inspect those big end bearings. Here we go. Now, it's really important that when you're putting a bike into storage and uh, the engine's in bits, you try and wrap it up best you can. Now, we've moved house with this bike like this. So, this bike had to go in a trailer, an open trailer, to get to this new house. So, we were hoping very much that a lot of the gravel road dust would be kept out by this plastic sheeting. Now obviously there were gaps in it and you can see there's loads of dust all over the place, but we did. We, go. we did sort of cover it up best we could. And this is what we call pallet wrap. It's what you use to, to wrap pallets, well, wrap stuff on pallets in. It's really good for sort of preserving your bike. That. It's front wheel. I'll stick that down there. Okay. Cobwebs. Rags. Dirty rags. Jeez. Okay. That's one. Right, bit grubby, needs a clean, but we'll just check those big end bearings again before we go any further. Now, when you check in the, the big end bearings, and on two strokes, they have a needle roller bearing in there. The side to side is not really what you're looking at, although there is a spec on that, and I'll tell you that. We've got to measure that with a feeler gauge. But what you're trying to feel, i get my hand in without covering the camera, there we go is you're trying to feel for any kind of up and down movement between the conrod and the crank and that feels really good what you also need to check is to make sure that the conrod rotates all the way around freely and there's no notchy areas if it's notchy that's a good indication that the bearing has started to break up 
And one last check is to make sure that there's no bluing around the, the big end or the crankshaft area where it connects to on the journal, because that's a sign that it's overheated. And all this on this cylinder, the left-hand cylinder, looks great. So all I've got now to do is to measure that side-to-side -side movement or the clearance gap at the side of the conrod between the conrod and the crank web. So make sure you've got the conrod all the way over to one side, putting the full clearance to one side, and then you can get a feeler gauge down there. And I'll go and look in the manual and we'll see what that is. Okay, a bit of a shuffle around with the old camera. Hopefully I can get in. And basically we're just going to push the conrod over to one side. So I've got it coming towards me. And I'm on this side here. And the spec is 0.25 to 0.75 millimetres of side clearance on the big end. So I've got a 0.2 and a 0.05 feeler gauge here. A bit fiddly. But we can make it work. Now we're expecting that to fit. There we go, look. So 0.25 it easily goes between the big end and the crank web. No problems at all. So we'll go up a bit bigger now. Let's see if we've got a 0.5 on there somewhere. There we go. 0.5, so half a millimetre. And this time I can get away with just using a single feeler gauge. Let's see if that's going to fit down there. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. So the 0.5 is now in there. And that, there's quite a bit of drag on that, so I think we're getting somewhere close. It's pretty good. So I don't think we're going to be able to get the next size or the 0.75 in there, so we're definitely within spec, but we'll just double check. Okay, so I've got a 0.71 here. That's about, uh, that's pretty big actually. Okay, so this definitely, if this goes in, then we're getting pretty close, but I'm pretty sure it's not going to fit. You just got to make sure you don't butt with the washer that's there. No. Okay, that's cool. So this side is definitely in spec for the Conrod big end side clearance. That's that movement there. You can see it quite clearly on the camera now. And you can also see, whilst the camera's in this position, you can see the, roller, the needle roller bearings that form the bearing for the big end on the conrod. So you've got to check that they are free all the way around. And you can rotate the crank in order to do that, just to feel, feel that at no point does that, that bearing pick up and start to try and drag the conrod round with the crank uh, angularly, you know. And that all feels really good. Bear in mind this thing's been in bits for a year. That's not bad at all. So um, this is the right-hand cylinder. Of course, make sure there's no dirt in there. That'd be bad. Okay, and again, if I just bring that around a bit. Sorry, camera. You can see in there, the, very clearly, the needle rollers that form the conrod. So I've done the check round and round, and it doesn't catch anywhere. There's no pickup on that bearing. It looks, uh, well, there's no bluing, there's no discoloration of the bearing surfaces, the big end or the crank web on this side either, so that's all good. Um, we can check the side clearance, and I've gone straight for the 0.5 this time, because that's what it was on the other side. And that, just to say, fits down there. It's pretty tight, so it's definitely under 0.5. We're definitely there we go. Look. Definitely in spec on there. Cool. I would say it's probably about 0.4. So we're well under the 0.75 maximum. Sorry, camera. Cool. Let's go down to 0.4. There we go. 0.4, let's see if that fits in there nice and easily. There we go. That's about right. So we're definitely probably just a fraction above 0.4, but definitely under 0.5 of a millimetre. So we're certainly within spec there. Okay, 
So we've passed the, the, ins the inspections on discoloration, we've passed the inspection on freedom of bearing, it's not binding anywhere, and of course it's passed with the big end um, side gap. Now one last thing to do is to check for up and down movement. Again, just lifting the conrod up and down towards the camera, checking that there's no movement at all, and no, it's bang on, there's no play in that bearing. So again, that's a pass. So now my next job is to clean all of this up, and you can see there's some dirt down there, look, uh, that's got in there, a bit of dirt on the crank. Give all this a really good clean, get rid of all the old gasket, and you can see around here there's bits of gasket all over the place as we took it apart. And then, we can put some rags in the holes, cover all this up, and fit the new pistons. Okay, so just to clean around the inside of the crankcase where I can get, what I don't want it to be doing is spraying brake cleaner straight in there, because all that will do is wash all the dirt down to the bottom of the crankcase. Instead, I'm going to put some brake cleaner actually on a rag directly, and just go around basically trying to clean as much of the grime out as I can. I mean, there's no shrapnel, there's no metal down there, fortunately. That's very important. You might need to get like a screwdriver or something just to guide you, your rag, just so you can get into those. So you can use a screwdriver with your rag just to get into all those tight corners, just to get all that dirt out. And this is, you know, this is where all the work goes in, just making sure that everything's as clean as it possibly can be without doing a full engine rebuild, which is not really what I intended to do with this bike. Not at the moment. Not until we get a spare engine anyway. Because Ben's chomping at the bit to get it back on the road. I really can't blame him. Summer's coming. This is definitely one very cool bike to ride in the summer. So I'm not doing any of the gasket surfaces yet. I'm just cleaning around the crank case itself. With a damp rag. And the rag's damp with the brake cleaner. I'm not using water obviously. That would be pretty stupid. Just cleaning all that off. You know. Trying to get rid of as much of the contaminants as possible. There we go. Let me know if you think I've, I've missed any. Okay. Now. Not looking too bad. Just a little bit around there. Let's see if we can get in there, look. Get all that cleaned out. Cool. Okay, so once you've cleaned out all the, the debris and stuff, and they're going to use the rag, the clean rag out obviously, and put a clean rag in there around the con rod, and that's going to seal off and prevent any crap going down into the crankcase. And that's how we had the rags when we had the bike being stored as well, you know, we didn't want to risk any, any dirt getting down there. And I'm going to clean off the other side, the right hand cylinder next. Okay, so both uh, crankcases are pretty much as clean as I can get them now. And uh, obviously they're all blocked off with the rags. And now it's time to just very carefully ease away all the old gasket. And you've got to try and do this without causing really any harm to the actual uh, casing itself. It's not easy sometimes. And there's some products on the market where you can get, uh, you know, they, they help to dissolve the gaskets and help to prise them off the, off the actual surface. But a good blade 
is sort of the best way forward. And it's not easy with the camera in the way, I'm sure it'd be a lot easier for you guys. But just take your time and try and pull the pieces out rather than letting them drop onto the rag if you can help it because that's just more you've got to make sure doesn't go in the crankcase later on. Now today is uh, Sunday which means Ben's back out on his WR450 again terrorising all the Auckland car drivers. When really he should be at home doing this. Give me a hand. but He's not. Sometimes it's really awkward getting in and what you can use, providing you're super careful, is just a little screwdriver. Again, you've really got to try to avoid scouring or putting grooves into the aluminium. You're just really trying to pick off that gasket. There we go, look. Perfect. Okay. The aluminium is very easily scored, unfortunately. There we go. Now, I'm quite sure there are people out in the world that are far better at taking gaskets off than I am. This is how I do it. And it takes bloody ages, it really does, to do it carefully and accurately. Because, yeah, don't forget, these crankcases are really hard to come by as well. And we don't want to be causing ourselves too many problems if we can help it. So you can see I'm just starting to dig into the surface there. I'm not, I don't really like doing that, that's not good. Such a nice day outside today as well. Should be out riding, it's no good. Cool, okay, right, so over to this side. You find when you're doing this, you use heaps and heaps of rags, but you, you know, to try and maintain the whole thing to be as clean as possible, it's sort of the only way of doing it. Now, if I was doing a full rebuild, all this would look very, very different. It would look nice and clean and shiny, but I'm not. This is just the top end, so you've got to sort of clean as you go, unfortunately. One thing you can also do before you're ready to rebuild is just clean all these threads out with a with a wire brush. But again, make sure that your cylinder, that your crankcases are fully, you know, fully blocked off because you don't want any wire brush, any bits of wire off your wire brush going in the crankcase. That could be pretty terminal. So there you go, I've cleaned out, and it was amazing how deep these, uh, these little gullies were actually, these voids between the two cylinders. This one goes down to about 30 mil, and it was full of sand. Well, that's not going to help the cooling of the engine at all, is it? So I've removed all of that, vacuumed it all out, done the same with this one here, given it all a clean. And these rags are now tightly packed around the crankcase, preventing anything from falling down into the crankcase. And that's really, really important. If we get anything fall down there, We've got a big problem, it's going to be a full engine rebuild, no doubt. Okay, so it's now time to install the pistons. So let's go and take a look and see what we've got in the box. Okay, looking a bit grubby now, eh? Right, 
Inside the box we have some new piston rings. We have, obviously, a bit more in there, a nice shiny new piston. Got a gudgeon pin. Ooh, gudgeon pin bearing, or little end bearing we call that. And some packing. Cool, okay. Let's have a look at the piston first. Oh, it's pretty heavy. Oh, there we go, look. And of course, two new circlips. Okay, so the arrow there, look, that needs to go to the front of the motorcycle. Okay, it's got a point to the front. And that 200, well, that means it's two millimeters oversized piston. And uh, what else have we got in there? Well, these are really important. You can see your piston are in grooves here, look, and can you see we've got a dowel just there and another dowel just there. And those are to locate the two ends of the piston ring. They have to sit there. If they don't, A, the piston ring won't go on properly and you'll never get the barrel back on and you'll damage something, probably break a piston ring. And secondly, they're there to stop those piston rings from rotating on the piston. Because don't forget, you know, down that barrel, we've got all these really cool transfer ports. And we've got the exhaust port. This, is, this one's still got the power valve in it. So you can see the power valve just down there, look, and it rotates. Oh, look at that. So at maximum RPM, whoa, we'll open the power valve, bring the revs down, power valve closes and lowers the exhaust port. Bloody good, Yamaha. And you can see here at the base of the cylinder, all these transfer ports. One, two, three, four, five. And those transfer ports bring the mixture, the air fuel mixture up from the crankcase, and they then dollop it on top of the piston. The, the, the whole mixture gets sucked up as the piston comes down. It's pretty cool. Yes, lots and lots of transfer ports. So the positioning of those piston rings on the piston is absolutely critical because it's going to have to be somewhere where there's a little tiny bit of bore that runs all the way up and down. There's no, it can't run over where there's a port. Otherwise, the piston ring will just spring out slightly and it would jam in the bore. So make damn sure those two little pegs are in position and that you get the piston rings correctly lined up. Now, just before we pop the piston rings onto the piston, we've got to check uh, the end gap for the piston rings. Now, just to clarify, this is the top ring, okay? And you probably won't be able to see on the camera or not, but there's some very, very faint numbers on here. We've got 200 there, which means it's 2 mil oversize, and it's got a little letter R on this side here. The numbers should go to the top, and I know this is the top ring because of the shape that the ring is cut. If you can see that there, look, there you go, okay. And if you look on the piston, here, for the top ring, the dowel is central, whereas for the second ring, the dowel is offset. So for the second ring, we would use this piston ring here, look, and can you see that the actual piston ring is cut slightly at a, at a bit of an angle to allow for that offset dowel. And again, we've got some letters. So we've got an R and 200 just on there. Look, if you can see that or not, but there is. There's 200 there and letter R there. So that would go to the top. And you can see, if I line up the piston, you can see that the dowel's biased to the top of the groove. So the piston ring is cut, just scalloped away to allow for that. So that's the second ring. And also on the second ring, we have this little tiny spring that goes on behind the piston ring. But before we can fit those, we need to check the ring end gap. So to do that, so we just pop it down the bore, put the piston ring in the bore, twizzle it round. And we need to make sure that it's level in the bore. So we can use the piston for that, just very gently push that down, there we go, and now the piston ring is sat, sat in the bore, and you can just see the tiny gap between the two ends of the ring, and that's what we're going to measure. So the specification should be 0.3 to 0.45 millimeters. So we'll grab our feeler gauges again, 
And we'll have a little look. Point three. Where are we? There we are. Point three zero five. That's near as down it, isn't it? So we'll see if that goes through the gap. Let's just see if we can get this camera to focus for you. There we go. Yes, that does go through the gap. I turn it over across there. Look, so it goes through the gap quite easily. So now we'll find the next size up. So that was point three. Point three three, a fraction bigger. Oh, two stuck together. There. Look, that's not going to work, is it? There we go. Point three three. See if that goes through. I think it will. Yep, pretty easy. Golly, hope we're not going to be too big. Point three eight is the next one. Okay. It's getting a bit tighter now. I reckon the next one will be right. Okay. So let's see if we've got a point 0.4. Yes, there we go. Point Pretty tight. Hmm. I think we're just on. Ah, oh, there we go. Maybe. Just run it parallel to the bore and see if that goes through the gap. Damn your pistonry, you've moved. So I think we're just under point 0.4 by the looks of it. Yeah, that's too tight. So, we're in spec. Perfect for the top ring. Now, you've got to do this for each of the two bores and for both piston rings. And this is the left hand bore. And very carefully, because these are brand new rings, obviously, and they're quite brittle, the new rings. Okay, so that's a pass. Now, let's just try ring number two. I really don't want to break any piston rings because Ben will go mental because it'll take quite a while to get here. All right, we'll just square that up in the bore with the piston. Now, because these these bores have been rebored, it doesn't really matter too much where we position them in the bore because it should be the same all the way up and down. Should, the cylinder walls should be parallel. Okay, so let's try with point three eight again. We'll go straight in with that. That's sort of bang in the middle of spec, isn't it? Near enough. Yeah, that's pretty tight actually. So, perfect. That's really good. Okay, so we're bang in the middle of spec. Very happy with that. So, we can now fit these two rings to the left hand piston and we know it's the left hand piston and you want to know why well pretty easy actually because I'm going to put an L on it there we go right first of all we're going to have to fit this little spring thing very carefully he says without breaking it there we go So we'll stick it there, look. Right, piston ring time. Now, second ring and the pins at the top. So the ring needs to go that way around. And yes, double check, there's the lettering. So we can pop that on there now. Jeez. Don't break it, don't break it, don't break it, don't break it. Ugh, go off. OK, 
Okay, we're in the first groove, we're just going to walk it down to the second groove now. Jeez, there we go. Cool, so that's the second ring installed correctly with its little backing spring on there as well. Okay, now for the top ring. Now, top ring, you've got to go by the lettering again. So there's the, the marks, that's the top. And that needs to go on there like that. So we'll just pop that on there. There we go, that was pretty easy. Right, so that piston now has got both the rings on. And you've got to watch these little buggers because they tend to migrate around. Once they're in the bore, you won't have any bother. But you've got to keep an eye on them to make sure that they stay in alignment with those pins. Because if they don't, you've got a problem. That's how it will look when it's actually in the cylinder. You know, nice and squished up. So there's hardly any gap. That's what we want. Right, next job. We've got to fit one of these little circlips into the piston. Now I say one of these, we're going to fit the inner one. Alright, so this is the left hand piston, so we can fit the circlip on this side. And this is not easy, these things tend to fly around the workshop, and Ben didn't get any spare ones. I always buy spares because I'm good at flying, good at flying these over the workshop. They're a little bit of a shit to fit, to be honest. Jeez, they're pretty big. Okay, let's just get it in the groove first, oh, nearly. And you gotta remember, you gotta try and get these things in without squashing them too much, because the more you squash them, the more they lose their effort, so to speak. I'm gonna take these gloves off. You see, gloves don't always work. Sorry, they don't. Mechanics hands are meant to get dirty. There we go. Okay. So you can see now that the end of this, the, the clip is in the groove. And we can just offer that into there like that. And then, when we're ready, we can just use that like a little pry bar and drop it in. Jeez. It almost looked like I knew what I was doing. Perfect. Now, can you see that I've put the gap of that circlip pretty much opposite this bit here. Now that's that's there for getting the old circlip out later on. But you've got to make damn sure that you're fully in that groove. There we are. Because we weren't then. Excellent. So that one's now installed. And that's the inner, because obviously we've got the right hand cylinder there. That means that we can push the gudgeon pin with this little bearing. There we are, look. Here's the new gudgeon pin. All nicely wrapped up. You parts, you parts are cool. Look at that, shiny. Okay, that can now be pushed into there with some oil on it. We can get the new bearing. Here's the new bearing, look. And again, all this needs to be really well oiled as you build the whole thing up. That's the needle roller bearing, and basically it's just a bigger one of those that does the big end. But to change it, you've got to split the crank. Bit of a ball ache. So that sits in there. Oh. That sits in there, look like that. And of course, the, the conrod little end goes over there. Once it's in place, that'll get pushed all the way across till it touches this circlip here. And then we can put the second circlip in. And that's why you need the rags in the crankcase, because you can guarantee if that drops out, it's going to go straight down in your crankcase. Bad. Okay, so I'm going to build up the second piston now, and then we can put them both on the uh, on the conrods. Excellent. Right, piston number two. Where's my little marker pen? This is the right hand piston. There you go. Stick that over there for now. And there's all our little goodies. Then they're in gudgeon pin, circlips, and piston rings. Now we need to do the ring gap first for the right hand cylinder as well, so we'll do that right now. Okay. 
right hand cylinder and we'll just do piston number two first okay so again just to double check the uh oh where's the spec gone damn you what was it 0.3 to 0.45 wasn't it okay so we'll pop that in there rotate it round use the piston to just get it correctly placed in the bore and again we can see the ring gap just down there look okay now we're still we're still on point three eight which is bang in the middle of spec so we'll just see how that's going to sit yep it's a little bit slacker on that one let's try point four there we go yeah that one's a point four pretty damn tight but it does go through okay so 0.4 for that one and um, what's ring number one gonna be like still well within spec but slightly larger than the left hand cylinders there we go let's just try the 0.4 again while we've got it out this looks a lot smaller there we go point four again perfect well within spec okay Dum, dum, dum. Okay, little springy thing. Let's get that put on first. Like metal filings on a screwdriver, that's not good, is it? Okay. we go here is damn it okay ring number two and lettering to the top chamfer to the bottom double check so much easier that gloves on okay Done. That's that one. Top ring, markings to the top. Yep. There we go. Pop that on there. Excellent. Job done. Right. Now all we've got to do is fit the inner circlip. And the inner circlip this time, this is the right hand piston, so the inner circlip is going to be here because the left hand piston is here. So I'll see if I can be as successful at getting this one in as I was previously. It's not easy. There we go, that's pretty good. So again, the join of the circlip is pretty much, well, almost opposite, it's well away from anyway, that little groove there. Cool, okay, and just for storage purposes, we'll chuck this in there for now. And we'll get it all oiled up, and we'll put it onto the bike. There we are, good and pin. Whoa, cooking on gas now. Little end bearing, we'll stick that in there because it looks cool. Super job, right? Okay, so our two pistons, look at that, are ready 
to be installed now onto the respective conrods. Uh, we've measured the ring gaps, we've fitted the uh, one of the circlips, and I've just popped in the gudgeon pins with the bearings, just for good, just to hold them in place really, so we've got less bits to hold in our hands. And now we can get these put straight onto the bike. And once these are on, base gasket, and then the barrels can go on. No, they can't. A lie. I want to fit the uh, the power valves into the barrels before we fit the barrels. Right, pistons onto the bike. Okay, so our first job, I'm just going to blather the little end bearing. And I've got some two-stroke oil here. Just neat two-stroke oil. I'm just going to fill that bearing up with oil. And I'm going to plunk it in there, look. Right, gudgeon pin. Same again. And this kind of stuff I just cannot do with gloves on, unfortunately. There's just, it's just, you know, you can't hold the shit properly. Especially the little circlips. Right, one gudgeon pin. And Mr. Piston. So, don't forget, it's the arrow to the front of the bike. Now, we've already fitted the inner circlip, so we can just drop that straight over. Align the little end bearing. Give it a bit of a wiggle. He says... There we go, and push it all the way through. And now, essentially, that's where it should be. Now, all that's left to do now is to fit that other circlip. Now, you've seen me do this, so I'm not going to bother moving the camera because it's just going to get in the way. Okay. Okay, I think we're in. Get me torch, have a little look. Oh yes. Absolutely fantastic. Okay, and then you can spend the rest of your life now realigning the piston rings. Perfect. Okay, so that piston is now in position. I'm just going to dribble a bit of oil all around the piston. So it sort of works its way into the piston rings as well. Oh, she'll smoke nice when she starts up now, won't she? There we go. Rings again realigned. Super. Okay, let's get the other one fitted. So that's the conrod as far up as it will go. TDC. Now we can fit that piston. I'm just going to put this rag around that piston there. It's really important. I can't stress how important it is to take your time doing this kind of stuff. If you want it to be right, do it once. And that way, it should not go to plan. Okay, so same again. I'm just going to flood the little end bearing with two stroke oil. Get plenty of lubrication on there. And then we can pop it straight in the conrod. Okay, now Mr. Piston, again, arrow to the front, very important. Obviously the inner circlip's already in. Just gonna pop that on there for a second. And I can lube up the gudgeon pin, plenty of oil on there as well. And now, we can align everything, drop the gudgeon pin through, there we go, all the way as far as we can. And now we're ready for fitting the uh, the outer circlip again. Jeez, last one. This has got to be the one that fires across the workshop. Please don't fire across the workshop. Very important you get that first tail in the groove before you try to lever the whole thing in carefully. Remember, you're trying to minimize the compression of this to get it to go in. Oh, I think we're there. Torchy.
Perfect. Bloody hell. That's a first. Right. Realign the piston rings. There we go. And just blather some oil all over the place. Cool. Excellent. Plenty of two stroke oil. Super job. Right, so we're going to be away from the bike for a little bit of time. So I'm going to put a rag over all of that to keep the dust down. There we go, another nice clean rag. Perfect. Well, there you go, that's stage one of the TDR 250 top end rebuild. And just as a quick recap on this particular video, we've in, we started off by inspecting the big end bearings just to make sure that they were all good. We cleaned off the uh, the base gasket from the crank cases, and uh, I showed you how to measure ring gap on the cylinders, the new piston rings, how to fit those new piston rings to the pistons, and uh, and then how to fit the pistons to the conrods. So now. All that's done. Pistons are all in place and ready. I've shown you what all the markings mean and what the little dowels do on the side of the piston for the piston rings. I've shown you which way up the piston rings go, which one's piston ring number one, the top ring, which one's the second ring, and how that little uh, little spring that sits behind ring number two works, You know wh how that was positioned. So that brings us to the end of the very first of the TDR250 Top End Rebuild videos, episode one now done in the can so to speak and on episode two I'm going to show you how to replace the power valves rum, 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 rum. see found that up power valves in both of the two cylinders that's new power valves new bushes new seals golly no expense spared here Ben's pockets must be quite deep at the moment or oh, his coffers pretty damned empty after just bought all these bits anyway Okay, so uh, if you found this helpful, then, uh, you know, any questions, add them down the bottom. If you want to subscribe, please do. Click the subscribe button. But why not also go on to the little gear symbol next to it and uh, turn on notifications. And that way you'll find out when any new videos get uploaded. And there's going to be quite a few because Ben wants his bike back on the road ASAP. Okay. Well, there you go. My name's Andy Young, and you've been watching my Andy Mechanic YouTube channel. Cheers, guys. Over and out.